Welcome everybody to the history and culture of steampunk, largely talking about the 19th century, a fascinating period in history. Spain was bleeding colonies, France was going bipolar between dudes named Napoleon and dudes named Louis. Uh, King George was dead in England, Victoria was in charge, and the American West was just getting wild. I am your moderator, Graham Bradley, author, illustrator, trucker extraordinaire, and we've got a great lineup of panelists here. Let me pass the mic down, and we'll get some introductions out of the way. Hi, I'm Dan Willis. Uh, back in the day, I used to write for Wizards of the Coast in their Dragonlance brand. I keep forgetting you move your hand on this microphone and you get all this stuff, so I'll try not to do that. Uh, current uh, series is the Arcane Casebook, which is diesel punk, but a little bit further up in time than steampunk. Uh, 1930s noir detective stories, uh, lots of magic and fun. Those you can get on Amazon, and I've got cards for a free downloadable book for all you wonderful people if you want to come up and grab one. I'm Jess Lindsay. I love steampunk. I cosplay. Um, I haven't actually published anything yet, still working on that. Um, but I decided that I don't know anything about the steampunk culture outside of Europe and America because nobody talks about it. So I went and did some research, so I am prepared. I'm Scott Taylor, local author and screenwriter, and my first two professionally sold stories were steampunk, and right now I'm writing a lot of different stuff. Actually, can you guys hear me? Okay, that was, that was, we, only have, we only have two microphones, so we, uh, I'm Larry Correa, uh, I've written about 20, uh, 21 novels now and about 50 short stories I've published in uh, a couple of New York Times bestsellers and stuff. I've got a couple books that are actually steampunk, uh, set in the War Machine universe. Uh, that I wrote for, for that, uh, and I've got another series, The Grimdor Chronicles, that is more diesel punk, like Dan, so 1930s, but a lot of the same general vibes, so. Excellent, now that we've got that done, we are going to start off by asking why are we so fascinated by this era, and I think we will have our most flamboyant panelist answer that question first. <laughs> seen what I'm wearing. This is why it's so cool. <laughs> um, really a lot, if you look back at what was going on during that time period, there's a lot of inventing, a lot of new technology coming out. Fashion is changing along with the, excuse me, with the technology. And it's so cool to look and see all of that progress in just this short period of time. <laughs> That's the short answer. <laughs> all right. Scott, what do you got for us? So the question is why we find it fascinating? Yes. The thing that I've always loved about steampunk is, is its endless possibilities. Uh, just when you think you have it at the genre nailed down, like Wild West or Victorian, then comes along um, Westerfield's stories of uh, alien creatures in steampunk. And it just, it is, it is new enough that it, um, it's not seen the boundaries, it's not seen um, where it's, it's, I, I still think it's none of us. I'm in it for the Zeppelins. <laughs> As opposed to being in it for the gear. The, uh, I think that, that really, steampunk harkens back to an era when human beings were able to do things with technology that were literally unthinkable. Uh, my my great-grandfather, when he grew up, the way you got around was on a horse. That's the only way anybody got around. Before he died, he watched Neil Armstrong walk on the moon on a television set. Uh, we kind of forget how fast technology moves, and the Victorian era is the beginning of that movement. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of get caught in the modern world, I think, a lot of times, to thinking small. Oh, we, we can't solve this problem. This problem's too big. In the, in the Victorian era, no problem was too big. You know, they had technology and human ingenuity and by God they could solve it. And there was an attitude there that I think comes through in a lot of the steampunk literature that really appeals to us because I think we don't like to think small as people. We like to think big. That is a perfect segue into the next question. When we're talking about attitude and temperament and imagination, what types of devices then can typically be developed when we are limiting ourselves to coal and steam? Can I start? Absolutely. So I, I researched like six or seven different countries and regions that weren't in Europe or America or North America, and every single one of them developed and in, an input a steam engine system in their country or nation or region, 
every single one. That's the coolest transportation of the time, guys. You can go, you know, it takes, what used to take three days now takes three hours. By steam transport like system, you're talking about transportation implements, yep. carriages, trains, that kind of thing? Okay. Oh yeah, trains were getting put in everywhere. And why wouldn't you? It's not that difficult a system to build. Well, we gotta, yeah, you gotta move those two apart, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you hear us without the mics? Yeah, we're okay. good. Because these are awful. We're just gonna build <laughs> these mics. Then. I can be loud. It's awful. <laughs> oh, thank, thank goodness. I got tinnitus, and so up here it's like this this nightmare of echoing sound effects. <laughs> All I can hear now is lawn sprinklers. <laughs> so yeah, so this is yeah. Thank you. All right, we'll talk loud for you. I promise. <clears throat> Anybody else want to weigh in then on the uh, on the limitations of call and steam versus the limitlessness of the human imagination? Well, that's the thing is is. What steam gave to that era was, I mean, if you wanted to have a two horsepower plow, you needed two horses. Uh, even the simplest donkey engine, when, when you start to get up to, I know it's a little bit later than steampunk, but uh, when you start to get up to that era, it was at five or six horsepower. And uh, you could do things using the technologies that had been discovered, you know, the, we talk about basic stuff, the inclined plane, the lever, the gear. Uh, you know, you look at the old water wheels before steam and what they were doing with those, and you could really only do those when you had a fast enough flowing river nearby that you could put your mill up against. And they would do things like pound paper pulp, grind stuff, I mean, they had all this different stuff working off of drive shaft cams, all in the same spot because that's where the power was. Whereas, once you get into steam, you can put a steam engine somewhere and run, a, you know, a town on it. Uh, it, it, it gave them the ability to not just magnify human ingenuity and human work, but multiply it geometrically. And that was, I mean, it must have been astounding at the time. So it was less than about what the, the limitations of what the machine was because they were still determining just what they could do with it. So what kinds of uh, magic systems are a natural fit for the steampunk aesthetic? Oh man, I've gone a little nuts on that. Let's hear it. Um, <laughs> Well, so like I said, mine's diesel, so it's like a little, like it's 1930s technology, so it's, it's moved forward. But uh, uh, I had a lot of fun with that because anytime you have a, a magic system interacting with technology, you set your technology level, you set your magic level, and then you got to kind of ask yourself, how do these two interact? If this, then what? Is kind of a big question for a writer. So you create something cool, and it's like, okay, so let's say if you add magical healing to a world. You got to ask yourself, what does this do? And all of a sudden, if you look at like the 1930s and you think, well, what if we could just have somebody who could just cure disease like that? Wow, it changes everything, right? What if you have someone who can teleport? What does that mean? And what are the repercussions? Uh, like, like controlling heat or electricity or cold or anything. Any magic system you have, ask yourself how you're going to do that. And human beings, the thing about humans is we are super, super freaking innovative and we love making money. So if there's a way that you can take a magic system and you can twist it so we can like do something cool with it to make a buck or make our lives easier, we're going to do it. And so, so when you're designing the two and you're putting them together, kind of think of how your magic will influence your technology and how your technology will influence your magic. If you make your magic powerful um, and you want you don't want it to change your technology too much, make it rare or make it costly. You know, so so there's a price to be paid. But if you want to make your magic super common, just keep in mind what that's going to do to everything. I mean, if, if people can teleport, that really kills the Zeppelin industry. <laughs> I just have to add, have any of you guys read Girl Genius? Oh, yeah. Yes. That ha that kind to me. That's kind of the steampunk magic. They have these creatures that don't exist. They basically have hyper intelligent superpowers. The sparks do. They can do things that normal people can't do. And um, any sufficiently advanced science that we don't understand is considered magic because we just don't understand how it works. If you look at the Jaeger monsters. That's basically magic in steampunk. God. Well, I was thinking about uh, Dave Butler's City of the Saints, if you're familiar with that, and, and he, he uses, uh, I would think it was more of sci-fi necessarily, but a magic, but he's got his zeppelins, they have these wings that, that, that take ions from the air and they do something and that's how they propel, and so if, I was reading that going, I wonder if this works, and of course it works, because it's, you know, it. The fact that those ships could never exist doesn't diminish the fact that he put them in there, and it's a it's an authentic steampunk story 
that has these, it's, it is a magic system, but it's more of a science, like you were alluding yeah. to. So the, the wonderful thing about the genre is it allows you to do that. You can go there. And I don't think anybody has a problem with, with those type of things. Yeah, one quick note on that. Uh, a lot of times you can go at this backwards too. So we don't necessarily need to design everything up front when you're outlining it. But let's say you're getting into the book and there's something you really want to do because you think it's awesome. Go back and rewrite it. Go back and change your magic system to make it work. Like I wanted to have a gravity defying, gravity altering fight scene. And I had a lot of fun with that. And so obviously my system required magical manipulation of gravity. So, so, so it's not, it's like a chicken and egg thing when we're doing this. If, so we have a cool effect. When you want to have ion wing battles that one, by golly, you could do it. You know, you just got to, you can, you could do anything you want in this genre. It's pretty wide open. It's kind of awesome. Yeah, that's the, the really nice thing that I like about steampunk is that it, you're dealing with te uh, what it appears to be technology, but really is magic. And uh, yeah, coal just doesn't burn that good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, 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 I, I wrote a, a steampunk western a bunch of years ago called the Flux Engine, and what I—it's a good I, book. Oh, it is. Uh, and I wanted to—I wanted to have these flying ships that didn't have gas bags. And so I, I started thinking it through, and I realized, well, what if that means is I have some kind of magical way of lifting. Them. And uh, but I wanted it to be steam powered. But if it's magic powered, why would you need a steam engine? So I came up with this thing where you have a bunch of crystals that have to move in like a giant clock type thing, and as they move, they generate a harmonic that lifts the ship. So you have to have a steam engine to turn the wheel that moves the crystals. And to me, that, that was what I want. I mean, I'm not presenting that as a great example of thinking. My point is that you have, I had magic and I had technology, and I wanted them to coexist, not for one to be on top of the other. And so you get a little thought, and you can, you can really take what's possible in steampunk and go, well, okay, steampunk robots wouldn't work, but if I had a little magic and I had it just the right way, I could sell this. And if you tell a good story, people will, will you know, they'll give you a good bit of uh, disbelief. That's, so. that's exactly what I was thinking, is the, the audience that we're writing for, they will go there with you. They are willing to, because they want to experience this wonder. They want their minds to be blown with the, with the things that we come up with. So I, I'm totally in agreement with that. Sometimes we waffle on the science of it, or we don't necessarily blend the science with the magic, but there's there's still some willingness to suspend disbelief on the part of the reader to, to accept it as, you know, retroactive science. Is there is there a limit to that, though? Is there a limit to how far you can go with steampunk technology when you're trying to, uh, to obey the laws of physics, such as you, you deem them in your universe? Um, Okay, real fast, before I answer that, and I just want to put a caveat on this. Anything that we tell you guys as writing advice is just advice. There's no hard and fast rules. Because any rule we come up with, we can quickly find a writer who violates the crap out of it and writes awesome books. There is an exception to every rule. Yeah. Who that rule? Yes. <laughs> so, so really, so, so on this one, more my, my suggestion is it's one of, or like, what, what can you get away with? It's one of internal consistency. Really more than, because you can go pretty freaking crazy in a book and, and, and do wild, wild outlandish things if you lay the groundwork for it and the, the universe allows for that. Because um, really, guys, there's a psychology to this and readers will give you a pass. So like if you have whatever your big idea is in the book, so if your big idea is the harmonic flux engine can levitate stuff, then you re anything related to that, readers give you a pass. But then, but if you're like writing this, uh, a novel and then it's been like there's been no vampires in the novel at all, and in the last couple pages there's vampires out of nowhere, then people are going to be like, what? Because you didn't lay the groundwork. And it seems to violate the rules you set up. People so will say that sucks. Yeah. <laughs> so if you do it though, if you set it up right, you can get away with anything. Very good point. I do remember an interview that Cherie Priest did about her Clockwork Century series where people were complaining about things that she had changed in the layout of Seattle in the mid-1800s. Now this tower wasn't built, or this weren't there, many, there weren't this many people there and stuff. She goes, yeah, you know what? There weren't any zombies there either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she, she had been consistent with that. Well, that is something you got to have to be aware of. If you write steampunk, somebody will nitpick you. Oh, yeah. That's not how insert whatever was, works, exists. 
And in the real world, absolutely, you're absolutely right. What a great knowledge of history you have to get out of my face. And yeah, like in, in, in one of mine, the Berlin Wall was built around the city of Berlin after we destroyed it with Tesla's peace ray, and we herded all the Kaiser zombies inside to keep them. <laughs> so, so why did I read that in seventh grade? Well, no, but people were like, people were like, well, that's not what the Berlin Wall was. I'm like, no, no, Sorry. wait, no kidding, really? <laughs> Well, the other, side of, the other side of that, though, I was talking about big ideas. There is a real quick segue. There's a guy who had a wingnut idea after World War II because they had a food problem because a lot of their fertile land had landmines in it. Uh, and uh, what he wanted to do was build a dam across the Straits of Gibraltar. It's a real thing. It's actually happened. And he proposed it. And what that would do was he wanted to drain down 50 feet of water off of the Mediterranean, which would have freed up millions of acres of farmland. You can look this up. It's really fascinating. And I'm, I'm totally using that in a book. I am totally going to use that in a book. Uh, in fact, this book series probably will use that at some point. But uh, because it's just too cool not to. What a wingnut! Guy wanted to build a dam across the Straits of Gibraltar and wall off the Mediterranean Sea. So go study history and use some. Because somebody will call me out and go, well, "That's ridiculous. No one would ever think of that." And I go, ah. <laughs> Getting off of that, a lot of um, really cool steampunk technology that I have seen used in fiction, and a lot of stuff that they're actually coming out with today um, is based on untested inventions of Leonardo da Vinci. Go look through da Vinci's notes and find something someone else hasn't used and make it work. And you can be like, no, da Vinci came up with this first. I just figured out how it would work. And it's the coolest stuff, too. Absolutely. So here's a question that I, would, I hope all four of you will chime in on. Uh, it's a, it's a two-part question. The first part is, what themes in steampunk work well? Even ones that have been done frequently, what, what are the, the themes or elements of steampunk that work well? We'll start with Dan. Oh, okay. Um, Jimmy Music. Well, I just ran off the mouth, so I was going to let somebody else have a chance. But okay. Uh, I don't know. I described, somebody said, you know, I tell people, well, I write steampunk, and they're like, well, what is that? And I said, well, it's, you know, science fiction set in the past. It's mad scientists and ray guns and monsters and airships, and it's wonderful, you know? Uh, Zeppelins is the one, I mean, you know, Zeppelins and people with gears on their hats is, is the thing that everybody always has in, in steampunk, and yet we just love it. Everybody loves it. Flying ships, what is not cool about that? <laughs> so I'm always reminded of, uh, of uh, Bilbo Baggins' quote from The Hobbit, who talked about uh, he's dreaming. It says uh, something about going and seeing the hills and looking into the caves and, and wearing a sword instead of a walking stick. And I always picture that standing on the deck of an airship with the you know the wheel in your hand and the wind in your face, goggles on because you don't want bugs to hit you. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, I, I agree. It's it's not so much what it, there are th things that are expected. Just like the romance genre, you expect the person on the moors. You expect you know all these things. With steampunk, you, they, you've come to expect these things. Now, uh, there's obviously good and bad uh, out there, but but there's always people pushing the, the limits. I what I find that I like about steampunk, and I brought it up before, is is the surprises. It's the new stuff. It's it's the stuff that we don't think of steampunk that they made it steampunk, and I love that they can do that with the genre. That it's that elastic. They bend that way. I think elastic's a good a good way to refer to it. Um, give you guys an example. There's a book coming out as uh, a collaboration between John Ringo and two new super talented, really talented young authors, Casey Ezel and Chris Smith. And it's it takes place now. It's post-apocalyptic steampunk after a giant an invasion of giant ants. <laughs> okay, but what it was, it was a thought. It started out as a thought experiment because Ringo was on a steampunk panel and he doesn't actually like steampunk. And he took it as a personal challenge. He's like, well, I'm going to write a steampunk sci fi that actually makes sense to use steam power. He's like, why would you use steam power now? And what it was is anything that generates electricity um, attracts the giant ants <laughs> and they kill you. And so basically, the, the mankind has rebuilt civilization in the aftermath of the giant ant invasion, and the technology that we can use is steam. And so he's created a steampunk modern post-apocalypse. Do we know a title for that? Um, 
Hey Bridget, you know the title of that? I don't think it's released yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's a strange title. Strange you can't just drop that out there and like you can't get it. You can't even know what it is. Yeah, see, but you guys remember I get to see the books really early. If Ringo's name on it, just follow it. Ringo Smith, Giant Ants, Electricity, got it. Yeah, yeah. Just watch, watch, for, watch for a Ringo collaboration. That'll be the one. With Giant Ants on the cover, that's probably it. I think the thing that for me is biggest in steampunk, I love the fashion, I love the aesthetic. I like the Britishness of it because my family is very, very genetically British. Um, but I also love like the mad science is the coolest thing because with the when you throw in that crazy inventor, that's where the everything comes out. That's where you get the crazy perfect coffee from Girl Genius. That's where you get the entirety of the Dolls of New Albion, which is the best opera ever. If you haven't heard it, yes. Um, but it's it's that. They're the ones who, they're called mad scientists because everybody's like, well, you're crazy, you can't do that. Yes, you can, I just did. They actually have that line in Venom, by the way. <laughs> awesome. As a follow-up to that, what are some of the themes that fall flat in Steampunk? That maybe they are overdone or maybe they're just done so much that they're done poorly? Chew on that one for a second. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to ever say that anything is truly overdone because anytime somebody says something's done, it just takes someone to come along and do a new good spin on it. You know, because you always see, you all, this is just did zombies are dead, or vampires are dead, or or spaceships are dead, and it just no, it's not. Or pirate movies are dead. They, they, that, that happens like a, that's like a ten year cycle. You know what I mean? And it happens over and over again. But I honestly think it just takes someone to come along and put a good, talented, fresh spin on it. You know, and every now and then somebody comes along who makes a really crappy product that kind of kills it for a while and scares people away. But it just takes enough time for people to get over the the, the trauma of the suffering. <laughs> and you know, and a lot of times writers we take this stuff as a challenge. Now people are like, well, you can't talk about this. Well, by golly, I'll show you. That's yeah, right. You know, I got a novel where I used Deus Ex Machina twice because people said you shouldn't do that. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah. So I, I don't think there is. I don't think there is. I, think I actually many. had somebody tell me the other day. She's like, I don't get why everybody's so obsessed with cogs and gears. That's not a steampunk era thing what? that had been around for hundreds of years before and I'm like yes but that's what they started with in steampunk steam came along like halfway through that era so it was kind of interesting so it depends on who you ask as for this person that I was talking to cogs and gears aren't really a staple new in, in, exciting thing for steampunk it's old hat at that point yeah we really should never as artists we should never ever and this is not just for this but it's in general artists we should never ever limit ourselves you guys never limit what you write yeah. based upon somebody out there being butthurt or offended about it yes <laughs> so you guys do what you want that's that's pretty meta with just talking about mad scientists and no limitations and then we got our mad scientists here talking about no limitations that's, that's good stuff. <laughs> what are some of your guys' favorite reads in the genre some books that, that you would recommend that everybody read to, to get a good sampling of what steampunk's all about not a book, but Girl Genius. <laughs> Actually, it is a book now. They yeah, have a yeah, novelization. Go read Girl Genius by Phil and Kaya Folio. Yeah, it started off as a comic book, and you would turn it into a webcomic, and unfortunately, the pace of the webcomic is really slow. It drives me nuts, but it's brilliant. And Phil Folio is such a funny, talented guy. I met him once. He's just, it's just like he's supposed to be. Uh, amazing, amazing guy. He and his wife. Uh, that's a great series. Uh, Cherry Priest's Bone Shaker isn't bad. Um, I shouldn't say it's bad, it's a good story. I, did, <laughs> I was expecting something I didn't get, and so for me, it kind of put me off a little bit, but I realized it's still a really good story. Um, I'm drawing a blank now. Larry, of course, wrote, the, wrote their Quim Noir which, uh, series, which is great. 19, 19, I thought it was 40s, but you say 30s. Uh, 1932, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, there's a new one coming out set in 1956, so oh. that's actually going to be like Ray Gun Punk. So, <laughs> I don't know, we just like put punk after stuff so, yeah. and writers, it's like kind of a we do. So, so when, when, I, when I come out with, this, the whole point of this is I'm going to move, I'm going to skip forward in time with this series too. So when I do that, I can be following you again. Great. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. <laughs> that's okay. Actually I'll let him play the trail. You know? that's, that's perfect. So, Sorry. No, you're all right. <laughs> There's uh, some high, high level steampunk. Uh, Melville, he's written some stuff. Um, the, is it uh, the title is escaping me? But uh, that's yeah. that's that that's not just gears and cogs and steam. That's 
but some higher end stuff. The city of the city. Yeah, this. Well, I'll see. I no, that's uh, China Me though, right? You're talking yeah, about Herman Melville yeah. or? Herman Melville. Yeah. Oh, no, not Herman Melville. China. Yeah. China. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's the one. Though well, that does bring up, you know, there's this guy Jules Verne who wrote a lot of great steampunk. He did uh, probably read. Yeah. The, the granddaddy there. Uh, he did was, it. It wasn't steampunk uh, at the time, it was yeah. sci fi. But it's actually, my husband pointed that out to me when I did this a similar panel to this last year. He was like, basically, steampunk is just Victorian era sci fi before sci fi existed. Is Dragons of the Confederacy? Confederacy? That's, you know, that's straight up steampunk, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's what, that, I, I, I swear to, on, on lots and lots of stacks of Bibles, that book two will come out. The, the publisher put out book one, which kind of ends on a cliffhanger, and then never put out book two. And so I'm going to get the rights back, and I will put out book two, and I will. Those of you who have read it and are frustrated, I will make the first book free on Amazon, and you can pick it up sometime later this year. Well, the second book's been written. Dragons of the Confederacy. It's a, it's a series I wrote with Tracy Hickman. Well, yes, thank you books. very much. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a steampunky take on the Civil War with walking tanks and the Southwest Dragons, and it's, it's, it's a thing. But. I feel like that should be a lot more popular than it is because I had not heard of it until just yeah, well, now. Well, the second book didn't come out, so you don't get to hear the That's end of the story. It talks about. You know, but very well, that comes out, everybody will be talking about it. I, I swear, this year, the second book will be out. I promise. I just have to put covers on them, and it's done. Uh, another good uh, example is Kevin Anderson's clockwork. Um, clockwork Angels. Angels. Yeah. That's fascinating. How about Leviathan? Yeah, you had well, mentioned uh, Westerfeld, yes. Leviathan, Behemoth, Goliath. That's one where they, they started doing um, genetic manipulation of creatures to, you know, the, the allies had biological creations in the... When I read those, it was just like, okay, the door has been just blown open. I mean, you, if you can go there, it's, you can go anywhere. Go anywhere. Yeah. You can go anywhere. Somebody who went just about anywhere with it as well was, was Mike Resnick with his Weird West tale, starting with um, the, the Buntline special. Uh, it's, it's Edison, it's Ned Buntline, it's Doc Holliday and Wyatt Earp, it's in Tombstone, Arizona, it's in Leadville, Colorado, there's Native American magic, I mean, it's just, he, he goes just about anywhere. By the end of the series, they're resurrecting dinosaurs and sending them after each other. So, <laughs> again, like what Larry said, it, it's consistent within the world that he's built, but it's, it is such a rip-roaring fast ride. The first one is called the Buntline Special. Uh, plus the and Mike Resnick is crazy talented. He's very, very, very good. And then, and it amazed me how much of that book was just like dialogue back and forth, but you get so much of it from that, and that's what helps you know, keep the, the pace going. It, it doesn't bog itself down and, and look too much of what it created as much as just, you know, taking it on a, on a jog through the world. I have one more. I just, this last winter, I saw Mortal Engines, and then I found out that it was a book first, and that one was so cool because they took this yeah. steam technology because it's post-apocalyptic. They took this steam technology and said, we have to keep our cities moving because everything is falling apart around us. Let's go steampunk our cities. And it's fascinating and it's so cool. And I need to go and read the books. I just haven't gotten hold of them yet. And we're talking about mad science and crazy ideas that they have. Like aside from just putting the entire city on tracks and wheels and chasing down small towns and whatnot, they, they mentioned later on in the first book, I haven't gotten into the, the, the second one, but they're talking about eventually consuming the whole world and making the Earth mobile, and then we're going to go chase down the sun, and then we're going to chase down other <laughs> solar systems. You're just like, I can only do so much galaxy brain with this. It doesn't be a lot of energy, but they got the next space opera. They got the next 40,000 years planned out of existence. So. Well, there, is a, there is a book called Galaxy of Stars, written by Tracy Hickman, which is steampunk in space. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he had a rights problem, and so there's like one book in a, what was supposed to be a trilogy, and that's all. Because somebody sued him over, over something, Wizards of the Coast. He, he used something that he thought up, but they had, I guess, kited in front of him. I don't know the, the whole story, he never, never told me, but it's, it's, a fan, it's more of an age of sail, but it's very much, you know, space, tall ship stuff. It's really neat. If you like that sort of thing, I mean, if you don't like that sort of thing, but. Requiem of Stars, that's what it's called. Only well, terrible stars. people don't like Tracy Hickman. <laughs> cool. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left. Why don't we open up the floor for some questions? How is electricity used in steampunk? However you want, as long as it's consistent, right? Yeah, the, electricity was a big thing during that era. Yeah, we've known how to generate electricity since, you know, Voltaire and uh, way back, so you can use electricity any way you want. And nobody really can. You don't have to listen. 
for questions like that, that's one where I would recommend taking up an interest in basic engineering and getting some books from the library, just getting an idea of the history of that. Louis Renault was a, a French inventor and engineer who kind of refined the process of using copper and acid to store electricity and invent batteries. Um, as far as I know, steampunk was kind of pre-dynamo, so they didn't have a way of, of storing electricity that they were generating. They kind of had to generate it in real time as they used it. Whereas storing it in batteries for, for later use kind of came after the fact, and that's when they started putting it in cars. And, and as, as soon as you add magic to your technology, then you can store power and you can store the electricity in a crystal. You know, <laughs> Ben Franklin shows up a lot in various books as like you know electrical wizard. So, and it, it's a later later era. I swear we've all used Tesla. Yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's speaking of overdone tropes, we've all done that. Yeah. Yeah. Done that. I'm guilty. Tesla showed up in Leviathan as well. Yep. Yeah. We, like I said, it's a it's a trope. We have all done that. So, I saw a hand back there. I got the uh, title for the Ringo book. So you want to know it? Maybe? Let's hear it. Okay, it is going to be released in spring of 2020. The first book is called Gunpowder and Embers, and the series will be called Last Judgment, Spire, book one. I hope that helps you. Awesome, so thank you. Visual. Cool. I know a guy. <laughs> I, I, I help brainstorm it. <laughs> yes? Um, could you create a world where magic is steampunk, where the ability to make things out of gears and steam is seen as magic? Sure, you Absolutely. Can totally do that. Yeah, if you get mad scientists, that's... that's... Wizard of Whitechapel. <coughs> Sorry, say that louder? Wizard of Whitechapel. That's an existing title? Mm -hmm. Wizard of Whitechapel. It goes through different... And it's not like your story has to focus on <laughs> steam. It's not like you have to... I mean, and it's in the title, but... It's not like that has to be the main overall arc of, of the story. Well, a quick note on genre, guys. Don't get too hung up on what genre your story is or if your story obeys genre conventions. Because genre really only exists so that originally so that bookstores knew where to put stuff on shelves and uh, and librarians knew what to like you know direct people towards. And now it's so Amazon can know what category to put your book in. Um, really, so most of us up here who write, you know, steampunk, it's actually a bunch of different genres stuck together. We've, we've done uh, Weird West, um, like my steampunk is actually shelved under epic fantasy or, sor or, sor or sorcery, um, you know, game tie-in novels. So, so it could be anything. So don't get too hung up on that. There's not really a hard and fast rule. You can call it what you want. There's a meme that circulates a couple times a year that shows like, okay, things that are steampunk and then things that have fallen under the umbrella, and now you've got atom punk, ray punk, nuke punk, and diesel punk, and it, 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 it splits. But yeah, it's mostly for classification. Uh, I saw a hand back there, and then we'll get to you. So yes? Uh, would you say a lot of what you have said, uh, what you've talked about here, also applies to other <clears throat> umbrella topics, you know, like cyberpunk or diesel punk? Sure. Oh, yeah. Yes. Totally. So a lot of it's just you know following the rules that you set up for yourself. Yeah, don't like honestly don't get too hung up on genre. De genre definitions of people who get really really hung up on like is this this and does this fit in this box are usually critics and other people who do nothing of worth. <laughs> My husband and I have had long arguments about what is steampunk and what falls under diesel punk and other punk subcategories, and I'm like. Steampunk is the umbrella. I have the high ground. <laughs> so it really, uh, all of those fall under just what is sci what is the time period of the sci-fi that you're doing. And cyberpunk is really because William Gibson's marketing person thought it sounded cool, you know, to sell books. And, and, but he just did something new and unique, and there's a million things that fall under that category too. But honestly, it's just the, the key at the end of the day is just tell the best dang story you can within whatever boundaries you personally want to set up for that universe. Excellent. Yes, you. So, to answer the question about magic powering the steampunk type things, its subgenre is actually called gas lamp fantasy, but it is still in steampunk. If you really want to get your box right. Yeah. <laughs> How many times can we split this hair? I, know. I just wallow all over several boxes. So I, I don't know. <laughs> Here's a question I'm going to pitch. Do we know where the word steampunk originated? I mean, did it yes, start with cyberpunk and they throw the punk on other things? Yeah. Jeter we, coined it. Who? Jeter, the, um, the three authors you haven't mentioned for people who need to read James Blaylock, Jim Powers, and 
Jeter, what's his first name? Two. You know, their buddy, that guy. Anyway, Jeter in an interview. What were you guys writing? They were all writing this kind of thing. Oh, it's um, steampunk, because it wasn't cyberpunk. So, you know, steam, Age of Steam, Victorian. I'm, I'm not even shocked that Tim Powers had a hand in that. Yeah. That guy is Tim really Powers cool. is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like the rest of us look like dummies compared <laughs> to Tim Powers, right? That guy's, that guy's awesome. Uh, I think uh, his, like his predominant, if you were going to call a steampunk novel, would probably be the Anubis Gates. There was a lot of time travel and, and hopping around that it involved in that one. Oh man, mad scientist of an author. I love that guy. On Stranger Tides, not a steampunk read, but my favorite book of his. That movie did it no justice. Frankly, I think that Disney had to make that movie because there were too many elements in the previous movies that were like similar to that book. I wonder if he woke up and said, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you guys are going to make me a movie now. I, 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 I listened to Powers talk about Stranger's Tides like, at, a, at a steampunk convention. When you've got a Jack and an Elizabeth and a, and a marriage yeah. in the middle of a battle yes. and there's undead pirates and stuff, yeah. okay, there's just one too many dominoes that wind up on and all the, all the voodoo stuff. And yeah, that, that is stuff. <coughs> Definitely read the book. Did I see another hand? They're struck down. My God. I, oh, here. I, I enjoyed the Finishing School series. Is, is that the Gail Kerrigan? Yes, Etika, and espionage, isn't that considered yeah, that? Yeah, the finishing school woman, and she's got, you know, her, hers is a... Uh, it's in a blimp, I mean, they travel around. There's, there's some airship to it, there's some airship. vampire to it. Yeah. yeah. Gail, Gail Carriger, Gail yeah, Carriger, Carriger, I swear I could do this, I could talk. Yeah. yeah. She's, yeah. she's yeah, got like close to a dozen hour. books in uh -huh. two different series with a kind of open lap. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Parasol protection. Parasols, and, yeah. Right. Another hand? So, I know you said that you can do pretty much any genre of steampunk, and that's great, but is there a certain genre that is great for steampunk, like historical fiction or epic fantasy or something? Well, it lends well to those, it lends well to the Victorian era. I mean, the clothes, even though it's not, this is not what they wore, but because because steam was predominant, that's, I mean, it's a, it's a natural marriage of those two times. Uh, the Wild West is classic for creating stories, but, but you know, you're, you can put a story there. It just works well for certain things. Well, behind the scenes, okay, so my novel, Heart Magic, is uh, uh, probably probably the best-selling diesel funk oh, yeah, there's he's ever been. been. <clears throat> he's okay. okay, so, um, but it, the plot of it is uh, an epic fantasy. I brainstormed it as an epic fantasy, complete with, like, magic and wizards and, and uh, you know, all that stuff. And I changed the setting on a whim based upon my son reading Noir Spider-Man. So, so you could really, and I just like, wow, this is cool. I mean, Peter Parker in a fedora and a trench coat, that's badass. And then I was like, <laughs> and then I was brainstorming my friend and he's like, yeah, stuff is cooler when men wore hats. And I was like, yeah, and Zeppelins. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> this, this epic fantasy turned into an alternate history slash diesel steampunk kind of style thing. So really the question is, any story you want to tell, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer on the genre, because in this case, I, if you look at the plot and take out the, 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 the culture and the elements, it's a straight up epic fantasy quest plot. Yeah. Okay? It really is. It's a straight, with a, with a cast of characters that would be an uh, would be an epic fantasy adventuring crew. And so, so really, it could be, it could be anything. And of the, of the authors we've named up here, uh, we've had horror. We had straight up horror. We've had we had kind of uh, uh, action adventure. Um, gosh, what else? Mystery. Mystery. Oh, definitely mystery. A lot. That's a great one. Uh, romance. Romance. Yeah. Western. Sci Westerns. Sci-fi. Um, so really, the question is, what genre doesn't fit? And, uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, what Larry said, you tell it, you know, the best definition I've heard of steampunk ever was it's tomorrow's future yesterday. And because that fits, and anything, well, what about this, what about that, it fits. It's you know, sci-fi, but set in the past. So, you know, go, go nuts with it. Tell a good story. People will love it. And in terms of the time and place of your setting, it, it largely the question is, is why? Why steam? And that you know, makes me think of why, why Ringo decided to write that steam, but it was, it was present day, but post-apocalyptic. It's because we, we had to. Because giant ants will eat you if you use electricity. And what you can give you anyway, without electricity, destroy the modern world. And, and so it, was, it is a post-apocalyptic steam-powered story.
Excellent. Go ahead. I still want to know how big the ants are. Are you talking oh, about? Oh, they, they oh, vary that between big no, no, they, they vary between like they vary between like you know like big vicious ones and like like house size ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they eat electricity. So okay. yeah. it's pretty cool. Um, so, what are some good resources that you found as you like researched for your writing? Probably the person who's done the most research might be the one who can. Yeah. My research over the last few weeks has been what areas outside of Europe and North America, what's going on with them during this time period. And I was amazed at how many countries Napoleon tried to take over during the Steam Age, and he failed every single time. He was in Egypt, he was in South America, he took over Portugal, and they sent their capital to South America because they owned it at the time, and Portugal was under French rule. And I can't remember what the third one well, was. Well, no one really, that's my people, no one really rules Portugal. <laughs> <laughs> so, we were just drinking and fishing, and we're like, what's going on over there? Huh, you guys have fun with that. <laughs> it was fascinating because you had, uh, you also had the discovery and uh, colonization of Australia taking place during this time and Aboriginal people sailing over to meet the king. All of this crazy stuff happening all over the world, lots of wars. South America had like 50 wars in a 100 year period. It was great. I did not keep track. Um, you can do so much with this by looking at what's going on elsewhere in the world and taking, you know, put your steampunk in Japan and you can talk about the westernization of Japan and how they brought all those steam powered robots over too. <coughs> You could talk about how the Ottoman Empire was taken down by people in Zeppelins. You just gave us kangaroo punk and pure punk. <laughs> 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 Samurai punk exists, go watch for body That's much better than in 2017 when we invented disco punk. <laughs> that's, that's not a ray gun. This is a ray gun. <laughs> if you want to really have an interesting time about this, research the history of clockwork machines. Yes. Yeah. Uh, especially during the Deco era, when everything was bigger than it needed to be. Uh, you know, Deco went crazy. I, I was just going to say, I think a lot of writers, it behooves you to be a student of history. Read history. And it doesn't necessarily even need to be the right period, it just gives you ideas. Like, like, like uh, uh, Wikipedia is a great place to start. It's not necessarily always the That's best place to finish. That's what led me to all of these timelines. Yeah. Was, well, what happened during between these eras? <clears throat> well, here's a link to this country's timeline over on this official web page. Okay, well, like I found, there. Like I'm in research, I, 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 I had the, the Imperial J Japan as the bad guys because you know I wanted I wanted <laughs> samurai power basically. <laughs> so I wanted to fight that and ninjas. Obviously, you need ninjas. And uh, uh, but I was just doing research and on Wikipedia looking up various things. And he said clockwork, and I came across a thing called. Gakutensuko, which is like a, a Japanese robot man from, I want to say, the late 1800s. They designed a clockwork robot man. And that was so freaking cool. And also the pictures, it's the creepiest damn thing you've ever seen. It's so bizarre. But, but that led into an ever-widening wiki spiral uh, into like the history of robotics. And uh, you know, you can get Ideas everywhere and just milk them. <clears throat> just milk that cow till it's dry. You gotta, you gotta fill the well before you can draw. It's a super kakuten soku. That's where, that's Tokyo Raider. Right? That is where yeah. the super kakuten soku <laughs> comes from. Yeah. yeah. So I made a, I made a, uh, I made one that's um, forty tons. <laughs> yeah. and, and piggybacking off of what Larry said, like if, if we're talking about a genre that relies largely on defining itself as retro futurism, then you need to study a lot of history and study. Some basic engineering. Just you know, read read a lot of nonfiction. Be careful, and then, and then you start telling. Them that's where the fiction comes from. Yeah, be careful. You can go so far down the rabbit hole that you'll feel like you can't write your story because you don't know enough. At some point, you just got to be done and start writing. Yeah, none of us up here are engineers. I don't think we just fake it until we make it. Yeah, it breaks things. I don't fix things. Yeah. <laughs> I like taking things apart. It's usually easier to get to a point in the story where you go, "Did they have railroads back then?" <laughs> Yeah, and, and as that's, opposed to that's an appendage of world builders' disease. It, you know, even if you're well I'm reading stuff that actually happened, it's the same thing. Like you, you, you only go so deep before you actually start working on your. Craft. I mean, I wrote a book series about the 1930s, but I'm playing a Call of Cthulhu game right now, and somebody's like, "Hey, can we send a telegram across the Atlantic?" And I'm like, "I think so." I'm going to Google. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. Awesome. Any final questions? Sure. What was, what was the name of that job? Spell it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I wrote this book like five years ago, guys. Uh, G A K U T E N S O E. K U. K U. Yeah, I do, I do not know. My daughter's the one that speaks Japanese, not me. <laughs> I bet if you Google Japanese robot, you know, 1800s, you'll find it. It's either early 1900s or late 1800s. I, I can't remember. Yeah. It's been, too, I have researched too many books since then. And if you have to <coughs> Tokyo Raider on Audible, Bronson Pinchot is a killer narration. Oh yeah, my narrator story kills this series. Absolutely oh. bravo. He also does On Stranger Tides, and that was <laughs> such a good listen with him doing the voices and everything. So let's get a round of applause for our panelists.